Amen. We're finding Titus chapter 1 and 2 Corinthians and the 7th and 8th chapter. we bouncing through some of this uh, on, on this uh, on this morning. <clears throat> I ask you to repeat after me Titus 1 uh, in verse number 4. <clears throat> but to Titus, to Titus, a true son in our common faith, a true son in our common faith, grace, grace, grace mercy, 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 and peace, and peace from God, God the Father, from God the Father, and the Lord, and the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Our Savior. Our Savior. In the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul repetitively mentioned a young man by the name of Titus. The name means honorable. And he was the kind of man who Paul could trust with an important work. Let me share this with you because uh, although a few of you may be slightly older than me, <laughs> there's some things that as I age become more important. So as we look at this uh, pericope of text, I invite you to look at someone near you and ask them, what is your spiritual legacy? What is your spiritual legacy? Leave a spiritual legacy in your family or leave no legacy at all. I want to challenge you on this morning to not look at you, to not look at your present or even your past. But I want to challenge you to look at the future without you in it. We all love looking at the future with us in it. But I want to challenge you on this morning to look at the future without you in it. And so when I ask you, what are you, what are you leaving? What is it that you're going to leave? Uh, because in case you hadn't heard the news flash, uh, you are getting up out of here. <laughs> it may not be tomorrow, praise the Lord. But you are getting up out of here. Nobody is here forever. Uh, either the Lord will come back and we're all getting out of here at the same time, or we're getting out of here one by one, or in groups. Uh, but we ain't all, ain't nobody going to stay here uh, forever. And so if you're aware of that, you've got to begin to ask the question about what is it that you're actually leaving here? What is it that's, that, that you, every Christian has a ministry and every Christian has a stewardship? And that's also a legacy. You are going to leave something here. And if you think all you leave in here is a bunch of stuff, God is going to assess your soul based not on the stuff you live your life for. And if the culmination of your whole purpose is somehow connected to the stuff you got control of, you're going to be shocked to discover that had very little to do with who you really are. And most stuff that you focus on actually are contributions to your body and not to your soul. Yeah, yeah. And it's important to realize that you are more than your flesh. Don't put all your time and all your energy in the things that will, will actually be a satisfaction for your flesh and has no benefit for your soul. And so when you look at this idea, we talk about your legacy. I want you to, first of all, your legacy is people. The legacy that you live here will be people. 
There are streets in this city that are named after people. And all you know is the name of the street. Right. You don't know the legacy. Why they named this road after who was Mr. Benford? That they named Benford after. You know, who was he? Was there a Mr. Keystone? I don't know, I'm asking y'all. I'm not from here. <laughs> I mean, the point is the idea that, 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 if you, that there are buildings and there are places that are named after people. But even though you may call out their name, it has no meaning to you. Because their legacy was not that street. Or the building they, or even the state named after them. I mean, uh, 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 the Quakers are the ones who impacted Philadelphia, uh, the city of brotherly love, that's now better known as Philadelphia. I want you to realize that, that, that you are more than the stuff. You can say, I want to make sure I leave the best car you can buy for your kids if you want to. And a generation later, that bus bucket will mean nothing. I want you to begin to understand that your legacy, it really consists of the, the people in your life, the lives you planted yourself into. And if you get to the point that you miss that and begin to think your life's value, your life's significance is about all the stuff you buy. I was talking to someone recently, and they were saying, you know, now I've lost everything. I've lost, I've lost everything in my life. Well, just because you don't have a car, don't mean you lost everything. Because you don't have a job, doesn't mean you've lost everything. Because your mate has left you, does not mean you've lost everything. You are more than the things you have access to. And the moment you understand the value of what life is built on top of, you can build a life of significance and value. God has never needed you to have money in your pocket to be important to him. Amen. And so you've got to understand that when you leave here, people are not going to sit around and talk about how you... Some will talk about, I recall working at the rubber plant and late one night working graveyard shift and I was working in the lab. And I was on the other side of the weighing out some things. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, guys were talking, and they were talking about a guy who used to work at the, work at the plant with us back in the day. And, and they were saying about how, how yeah, man, you know, I, I recall how he would go hunting. He would cuss that old hunting dog blew out. And all they could remember, his legacy was how he cussed out his hunting dog. Oh, <laughs> what are your children going to remember about you? What are your siblings going to say when they mention you? Now, I know, some folks will say, that no good rascal died, owe me $35. <laughs> is that all your life has been about? You are leaving a legacy, and the legacy that you're leaving is connected to the people in your life. Paul talked about the idea of Titus in his discussion he actually, the book of Corinthians, he mentions Titus nine times. Titus is one, a part of Paul's spiritual legacy. Titus is somebody he planted himself into. He's somebody who actually, when Paul is gone, Titus can talk about how that man blessed my life. Timothy can say, he gave me a ministry. He connected me to a purpose bigger than myself. Can somebody say that you poured something of value inside of them about how to be more better and more valuable, not to make more money, but to be more like God? What is the legacy that you're leaving? I want you to see. Paul planted inside of Titus what already existed in Paul. 
So understand the dynamic here. That there's something fundamentally that you must have. Don't leave what not to do. Yeah, yeah. I've had people say, you know what? I just don't want to be like my dad. So the best you can leave your child was what not to be. Lord, I just don't want to be, don't want to be like my mother. Is that the best you can leave? Some of us are going to be gone, and when the time comes, all that can be said about you is that is an example of what not to be. It's sad when people that knew you best desire to follow you the least. Yeah. Something is traumatically wrong. Okay, you had to pay child support. They made you pay. Yeah, yeah. Every month, that no good woman made me go to court, making me pay. <laughs> Yet, this is the fruit of your loins. For some of us, the only thing you're going to leave here of value. Where your kids. Amen. Are you putting inside of them something? If they have value, you spend money on what's important to you. If you love your child, it might mean you gotta work three jobs. But if they're important, understand the significance of planting value into somebody who you actually love. Don't be so self-centered and so self-focused that every dime is more important to you than the people whose lives you need to touch. Amen. Because God knows when you get at that age, because the time will come when you can't run up the stairs no more. A time will come when you can't always eat. Your stomach can't take what it used to take. And you're going to need somebody now to say and look at you. I remember what you did for me. And I really commend those folk inside this family who taken the time of their lives and their energy and said, listen, my mother or my father, they were there for me. I'm going to set my life aside and took this time in the last years of their lives. I'm there for them because I want to know I appreciate what they did for me. You don't even know if the person that you're going to need at your last moments right. is the one you're rejecting and running from right now. Amen. 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 Don't leave an example of what not to be. Well, here's the thing. Ask somebody, are you sendable? Are you sendable? Somebody said, actually Mike Stakura said, the mark of a great church is not its seating capacity, but its sending capacity. The mark of the people of God does not consist of how big the building is. It consists of the kind of heart and commitment you have inside the people who claim to have a love for God. Look, look at this young man by the name of Titus. Paul sent him to Corinth. He sent him to Dal Dal Dalmatia. He sent him to Jerusalem. He took, him, he took him to Jerusalem. He sent him to Crete. He could send him somewhere. He can say to him, Titus, I need you to go and minister somebody. I need you to go and teach a class. I need you to go and develop some believers. Titus, you are needed to be used by God somewhere else where they have the kind of a heart and the kind of a spirit inside this man to function in the capacity there was. And that's why Paul can use them. You can't send somebody. Can you send people anywhere? Is there anybody in your life who you can send them do a good job? I know you guys folk you can send to go pick up some money. <laughs> but if nobody in your family will give a minute of their heart, their lives, and their time to the things of God, it says something about your ministry. Do you inspire others to this kind of a spirit? Are people inspired to say, I've watched your life, I've watched your attitude, I've watched your character. You inspire me to want to.
to be better. I, I see what you're trying to become. I thank God for what you planted inside of me. And I want to be the same kind of person that can inspire somebody else. Do you with Paul inspired Titus, inspired Timothy? He inspired them by putting inside them the same attitude and character that existed inside of him. And the devil knows how to keep you so busy that God can't use you. But I want you to understand here the dynamic of this, how this fits together, in the sense that who can you send for Jesus? Anybody you know? I, I, if you come to service with me, I, I buy you a hamburger. I ain't going nowhere with you. Why not? There has to be something about the person you are that makes you worth following. I'm not saying I'm not saying that you make people be something. But I'm saying if your faith is real to you, if it really has affected you, it's infectious. It's contagious. When people can see what God's hand has done in your life, it makes them look at you and say, I don't know where you got this from, but what I've seen inside of you seems valuable, important, and significant. I want some of that. Everybody acts that way. Amen. Amen. Right? You started buying new clothes every week and a brand new car every other day. Or every month. <laughs> Your friends, what you doing? How you, how you getting all those cars? Where all this money coming from? Well, I found a sweet way to get rich quick. I want to hear what you got. Why? Because I can see the effect it's having on you. If your attitude is all nasty. It was nasty before I got to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. It's double time nasty now. <laughs> Who wants some of that? If there's nothing about you that stands out and wins the hearing, can you send somebody for the purpose of Jesus? Because if you can't be sent, you can't send nobody. If we can't expect you to be called upon for any value, no, the reality is you cannot get somebody else to commit to something that you're not committed to on yourself. The first step of being able to be the kind of person who can be sent is you have to be the kind of person who can be sent yourself. Uh, my, my father, bless his soul, uh, but when he was living, uh, it wouldn't matter what that man asked me to do. It wasn't because he gave me money, because I recall one time I went to him, I was working at the rubber plant, had just started college, uh, and uh, I had a family, a wife and a child, and I was working at the plant with him. I went to him on the job, I said, Dad, listen, I said, I went to register for college the other day, my classes, and they, they let me register for the classes, and I signed up for them. I said, but I didn't have the money in my account. I realized, but you know, I was at the school already, so I wanted to check out, and I said, so if you could, I get paid on Friday, so would you lend me the money until Friday? He said, well, we'll talk about it tomorrow. I'm thinking, well, that's kind of tight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Checks up really written. Yeah. <laughs> so next day, I, I saw him. I said, how you doing? He said, well, good, son. He said, now, let me ask you a question about this thing. He said, now, uh, he said, now you wrote a check. I said, yes. He said, for money, you know you didn't have. I said, well, yeah, yeah. He said, and you work in the same job with me. I said, well, yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. He said, okay. And uh, he said, you knew when you wrote the check, you didn't have the money for the check. I said, well, yeah, I, I, I knew that. You know, I get paid on Friday, so, you know, you live to me there. I, he said, well, he said, well, I'm not going to give it to you. How you not going to give me? I mean, I'm, I'm going to go to college. And, you know. He said, no, because, you know, I mean, you're a grown man. So, no. I was upset. <laughs> I was hurt. How you not gonna let me want to pay back? 
that was the best lesson ever taught me. You know what that lesson was? Don't write a check. So and so don't eat bad. But I but I loved him because because he he gave me more than money. And I want you to realize he, he gave me an example that was what. The most expensive gift I ever got from my father was a good example. Mm -hmm. To the point, he poured into me what he had that was sincere with inside of him. Mm -hmm. So I could try to duplicate that. But see, if he'd been a lion, conniving, mm -hmm. if it had been some of those, Papa was a rolling stone. <laughs> They say, Papa, do some storefront preaching. <laughs> Living and death, stealing in the name of the Lord. <laughs> if he had been like that, I'd say he was a no good rascal. But he gave me something he planted inside of me, what was existing inside of him. He was the kind of man, if he was asked to do something for the Lord, he would do it. Because he loved the Lord, not for no money. I want you to realize, because he did that in front of me, I try to do that with my own life. All I'm trying to express is the idea that if you can't be sent, you can't send anybody. If we can't ask you to get involved, if saying something to you, we need somebody to help with the youth or with the singles or the seniors or, or be a part of this event or this program, man, I ain't going to do nothing. I ain't going to go. I look, look, all I know, I do what I want to do, what I want to do, and I ain't got nothing to do with now the rest of y'all. That if you can't be sent, you can't send nobody. Amen. If your attitude sets you to a place where nobody can say nothing to you, then scratch it. You can't be you. Are you sinnable? Can we call on you when you need it? Because if not, what value do you bring? To God, not us. He's first. Ask somebody, are you sinnable? And of course, you can't practice what you don't believe. The reason that you aren't able to be sent right now is because you don't believe what you talk about. If God is really real in your life, it will make you have to make some changes to your commitment. I, mean, I just can't get to church. You know, man, I'd be having hard weeks, man. I'd get off some time at 5 o'clock on Saturday evening. i got to clean my car, clean my clothes, clean my kitchen, clean the ground. i got to clean everything up. i got to do that by Monday. How important is God to you? If somebody called you on Saturday evening and offered you a gift or a trip somewhere, you got time. Because you respond based to what's important to you. Ask somebody, are you sendable? And I ask them, are you a partner? Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians. He said about Timothy, ask for Titus, well, ask for Titus, he is my partner, he's my co-worker. Do you not realize the moment you became a part of the family of God, the moment you became a Christian, it made you part of a partnership? Your decision to be added to the body of Christ made you a part. That's an essential component that you're supposed to bring as a part of this church. This church as a part of the family, you are called a part of the body of Christ. The church has a head. Romans chapter uh, twelve and verse uh, uh, three and four, uh, three through five talk about how four and five rather talk about how we are all members of one body. There's a part. There's a piece of the puzzle that you are supposed to be. And when that piece of the puzzle is missing, the whole piece can't come together. There's a piece that God has called you to be. He says he's called Titus. He's my true son, my brother, my fellow worker. There's a fellowship that you have in the gospel suggesting the idea that every time a person is added to the family of God and the body of Christ, God sees you as somebody who's now an integral part of the plan he's putting together. We expect stuff when, when the leadership gets before the church and say, listen, church, 
The church has everything it needs to accomplish every plan God has. Yeah. And if it cannot accomplish every plan God has, it's not because God sold us short. Come on, preacher. I just happen to be sitting up here on Sundays. I don't be looking at y'all. Lord have mercy. But every now and then, I can glance up and see who don't say. Glance up and see who don't give. Glance up and see who act like God owes them something. You are going to face your creator. Amen. You know, God's going to call you to account for even how you gave. Amen. Praise God. I, I, I go to restaurants, and uh, unless it's really ugly service, I try to always leave a tip. That's because, you know, the idea of, of, of blessing someone who served you. Is the right thing to do. Amen. When you give in a worship service, and let me just say in passing, if you're not a part of the Kingsley Terrace family, I ain't talking to you. Because in all honesty, the folk who are required to give are members of God's family. Amen. But understand, every time you come to worship service, do you not know that God is aware of what he gave you? He's going to call you to account for how you've handled your stewardship. And it's amazing that sometimes a Christian can come to worship, sit through a whole worship service every Sunday. And understand this, when you give, you do not give to me. All right. All right. I don't know if I like that sermon. I ain't going to give to the preacher. Baby, you don't give to me. That's right. I don't get what I got coming. Okay. Are you giving that? <laughs> I told the church years ago that 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 uh, what I do for ministry, I, we've been working like this for the Lord when I was getting twenty dollars a week. Amen. What I do, I do because I love the Lord. Amen. Now I can't get paid, and I will get paid whether I'm here or not. <laughs> but the reality is not that I don't do it for money. Uh -huh. Brother Hamble talked the other day; he was discussing this very concept that that you can't you can't pay him for being out here seven days a week doing stuff. That's right. That's right. And in all honesty, you couldn't afford to pay me either. Amen. Not by the hour. The money we spend, the energy and the time we spend counseling and working with folk around the world, you couldn't possibly for this stuff. But we don't do that for the pay. Amen. So not giving is not going to affect what God has done with us. Not giving is not going to stop all that God is trying to do with this church. Right. But not giving does affect how God deals with you. Because yeah. 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 he knows what he gave you. Yeah. 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 That's right. He's going to call you into yeah. account yeah. Right. for your stewardship. Yes, and God does not look at your giving based on what it, it praise God. Some folk come to worship service and they get to service and then at the time of giving it's like, oh. You want to do that little basket thing with you? See what I got left. That's why Brother, Brother Warren always says the Bible tells you that you're supposed to have purposeful giving. And don't act like you don't know what they're talking about because you purposeful your cardinal every month. You purpose your rent or house note every month. You purpose that, that you purpose that, that credit card that you got. You purpose stuff that you like and important to you. And God knows the kind of heart. Your heart identifies what you give to. And when you come in the presence of God and caught God, cut God short, you think he don't know that you did everything you wanted to do and came to him and act like you had nothing left? The reason some of us stay broke is because you're stealing from God every week. Preach it, bro. Who gonna give something to a thief? Preach it. Every time you come to worship, you cut God back, you cut God back. Well, I don't know. I, I, I ain't got no more. When I get some more, I get some more. God said, I ain't giving you nothing. Yeah. 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 You 
great. Use what you got. Why would I give you more when you're not having properly what I already gave you? Go ahead, teach it's God. called faith because you hear based on your trust in God. He's called a fellow worker. He's called a, and understand the concept here inside the passage. You are part of a body. I don't know about you, but I need every member of my body. Amen. If I go to the doctor, praise God, I went to the doctor about four years ago, and I was having some back trouble. I was, I was in a situation where if I stood still for five minutes, I'd have increasing pain. So I went to the this back doctor, he said, well, Mr. Hubbard, you know, you got a couple of bad discs back there, so you got a strip disc and a herniated disc. He said, you know, take about a couple of minutes, I'll, I'll cut you back there, I'll take that real quickly. I said, man, I, I, I'd like to keep everything I got. <laughs> <laughs> if it's at all possible, I don't want to give up anything I have. And so even if a doctor says, well, Mr. your tonsils are not that important, and, and that, uh, that hernia, uh, uh, your, uh, 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 Opinion. 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 We're not sure it has any real value. You know what? I don't need you to understand all that. All I need is to keep everything I got. <laughs> all I'm expressing to you is that every part of your physical body has value. Yes. 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 The Bible says you are part of the body of Christ. Yes. We need you. Because every part of the body is important. And if a member of the body is not functioning properly, it affects the whole body. Uh, Brother, Brother McDaniels had a surgery was back uh, about a month ago, and, and he was able to walk around and get around before the surgery. But, but he was limited. He could only walk so, he could only do so much because his body was limited because something was wrong with the body. Kingsley terrorists, we have some limitations because parts of our body ain't functioning Amen. like a part of the body. Yeah. 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 We got 20% of the membership doing 80% of the giving and 80% of the work. What would happen if your body functioned like that? God's body should never suffer. Amen. Praise Tell somebody, ask somebody, are you a partner? Are you a partner? Yeah, God bless. Now ask them, uh, are you a blessing? Are you a blessing? Understand this concept here. Today will never come again. Be a blessing, be a friend. Paul identifies the necessity of Titus was a blessing. Are you a blessing? What do you bring to this family? I know sometimes members, but you know what I mean, I'm just a member and I don't really, you know, I, I, I come here and I sit, you know, but I ain't really got nothing to offer. I don't know the Bible that well. I don't know all these people. I mean, I just, I'm just here. I'm glad to be able to come and walk out. You know, I, I, I've been around. I, I've been waiting on somebody to grab me and drag me upstairs and make me do something. I've been wanting somebody to throw a rope around my neck and my shoulder and drag me through the building. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm around here. Ain't y'all seen me around here? Won't somebody drag me and make me do something? Think what Sister Pippa think she, Sister Pippa said, she said, if I got to drag you, I don't want you to do it. Amen. You are a part, praise God, you are a part of the body of Christ. And you get, don't get that twisted. You know, uh, Mel was eight. I'm watching Brother Terrain and Warren and, and, and Hines. They don't look at me right or talk to me right. And, you know, I ain't doing nothing for them. We ain't doing nothing for them in the first place. What I do for the Lord, if every member in the church acted crazy, and thank God y'all don't. What I do for the Lord, I would do it regardless of how anybody else acts. And sometimes as members, you got to be careful. You get to the mindset, you begin to think that somehow you ought to gauge how you respond to God based on the folk around you. My connection is love you, Bless you, but my connection is with the Lord. Amen. And when I get involved and get engaged, I'm not getting involved and getting engaged to make you feel better. I'm doing what I think God wants me to do. Because at the end of the day, only pleasing Him is what's going to make sense. 
And being a blessing, what are you talking about, preacher? I want you to realize that God has put you inside his body that you might be a blessing. God has given you, in Genesis 12 and 2, and 2 God told Abraham, I will bless you so you will be a blessing. God blesses you so you can bless this body. Now, I don't know what to do. Don't come up every week saying, I need prayer. Call them. When you see them, shake their hand. I've been praying for you. How's that working out? How are your family doing? Well, you don't pull out about, I got my own stuff, I'm dealing with. Ain't nobody talking to me but my stuff. I'm my life is falling all apart. And when somebody go help me, when somebody will give me out my struggle, it's getting worse on me. Who, uh, who's gonna help me? I'm falling, I'm melting. <laughs> if you got out, if you get out of you long enough yes. and start blessing somebody else, yes. you'll be surprised how all the stuff on your back gets lighter because you stop focusing on yourself. Our biggest problem is the person inside your mirror. <laughs> Encourage somebody. Take time to care. Have words that heal, not words that wound. Your greatest sense is when you're able to bless someone else while you're going through your storm. <laughs> Man, I was going through some crazy stuff. I said, you know, man, this is crazy. Let me forget about me. All of a sudden, the world turned around. No, it would always turn around when you stop focused on yourself. Amen. You are blessed to be a blessing. Paul talks about Titus. He identifies this fact inside this text, verse 7, chapter 7, verse 6, 2 Corinthians. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by sending Titus. Paul said, I was so mad, I was going through, I was worried about the church in Corinth. And Paul said, man, I tell you, when I saw Titus coming, it lifted my spirits. Yes. There are some people who light a room up when they walk in. Yes. And there are some folk who will light a room up, room up when they walk out. <laughs> What kind of character do you have? I want you to see here, this young man inside this passage, Paul talks about him. He established the idea. He brings a peace of mind. Paul said he came, he brought comfort, he brought peace. When he showed up, I felt better. The church felt better because he showed up. It's optimistic. Matter of fact, Paul said when he comes, he will bring a good report. I did with so many people. There's some folks, God bless your soul, who don't know how to give a good report. How things going? Well, if I had your hand, I'd throw mine away. I take one step back, I get kicked back two steps. Every time I look up, it gets worse. You know, I can just well, I, I just pray sometime, Lord, Lord, why am I here just to suffer? But God ain't God don't love me, God don't care about me, God's against me, baby. If God was against you, you should not be dead and hurt. <laughs> just that you're allowed to still be here identifies the grace and the mercy and the goodness of God. He gave you another chance to get this mess right. But you got to understand there is a kind of a mindset. There are people who ought to walk in every child of God ought to have a kind of spirit that can actually see God's hand working. Yes. Yes. I love the saints who got older and have learned to trust in God for so long that when you talk to them, how you doing? Well, I've been hurting. But you know, but God is so good to me. How can you talk about God being good to you when you hurt? I would have visited Sister Abernathy when I was in, uh, lived in preaching in Alabama. Sister Abernathy was uh, getting close to 90 years of age and went to sit down at a table one day and was talking to her. And because uh, Sister Abernathy had lost a couple of her kids. And she had, and she was in pain. Every time she came to service, she had a step up. Every time she took a step into the building, she was in pain. In the last months of her life, at least a year or so of her life, she would come to worship sometime and would pass out of the service. We called the emergency, come to get her and take her, take her out because she was having such a difficult time with her health, you know, and, and some people say, well, so won't she just stay home? 
Because she loved the Lord. I said, I said, Sister Abbott out there, I said, how you doing? Matter of fact, most Sundays she came to service with a cane, and she would come with a cane, and I said, honey, you need some help? She said, no, I want to know help. <laughs> she told me since I was in my backyard, and uh, I fell in the yard, uh, and a uh, young man up the street was working in the, in the city, and they saw me, and they came over through my fence and said, can we help you up? She said, I didn't know help falling. <laughs> I didn't help getting up. But I asked her, I said, what do you contribute to, to where you are in life? She said, Brother Hubbard, from, from Alabama, she said, I've always had to fight. And, and I've, I've faced a lot of hurt and struggle and turmoil in life. My road has not been easy. But I've learned to just be the blessing I can be and let God handle the rest. You are blessed that you might be a blessing. But you can't be a blessing if every time you see something, all you see is everything is wrong. And every time folk talk to you, you always get a long grocery list of everything going wrong. I ain't, you know, I ain't got nothing to say. But if I had something to say, that preacher, the elders, deacons ain't worth nothing either for that. And them sisters, half of them ain't even right. And on top of that, and, and my other sisters that ain't right, the ones that ought to be running stuff ain't running stuff. The ones that are running stuff don't know what they doing, why they doing it. I don't know how it's gotten so far all these. But how's the weather? Well, the weather is nice. It's just too hot right now. <laughs> and it's going to rain this week. I mean, I'm tired of rain. It ain't Texas. Why is it raining over here all the time? <laughs> There's a dilemma when all you can see is everything wrong. Somehow you missed the step that God was in control and you're not called to want anything but learn to trust him. Are you a blessing? I'm not saying you close your eyes to things going wrong and see the good side of things, but I do what Paul said in Philippians, the fourth chapter. He said, think on these things. I want you to focus on all the things that you can find right. Anybody can tell you what's wrong, but put your hand to the plow. I don't think the building is clean enough. Then pick up some paper. Find a way to be a blessing. Paul said when Titus came, man, I was, it, was, it was hard for me, but when I saw Titus, it lifted my spirits. I felt better. I felt greater. Here's a man that brought some value. Every child of God ought to bring something of significance. Your, your words, are, there ought not to be consistent patterns of negative, degrading, downtrodden words out your mouth. Can't nobody do nothing right around here. Why is it every time we get to see that Bateman guy stepping up. Sit down. <laughs> Too excited about it. God ain't done nothing for you like that. <laughs> Get on my last minute. <laughs> Amen. Man, you got the little camera in the middle of the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do them. When you get active for the Lord, let me just give you a little insight. If you ever get active for God, here's something free. We're going to talk about you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Matter of fact, if ain't nobody talking about you, you probably ain't doing nothing. Amen. Amen. And the devil won't mess with you when you're going in the same direction. Amen. The devil is not going to fool with you yes. 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 when you're walking along the same yes. direction he's going. Yes. Yes. Some of like the ladies in worship see the Sunday, it was a, a, a holiday season, one night she was in the, and they had a special night service, and, and so, and so uh, uh, it was that night, they were singing at night, was, uh, and so, so these guys decided to play a trick, and they, they are whipped, and uh, 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 and turn the lights off in the building, in the middle of the city, and, 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 and came in there with a flashlight on some masks on, like it was the devil, and ran up on him. When they came inside, yelling and screaming, everybody ran out but her. 
And they walked upon her. She said, no, don't mess with me, devil. Don't mess with me. She said, you know I've been on your side all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody up here ain't trying to go to heaven. Yeah. All of establishing right. for you is the importance of realizing mm -hmm. that you're called to be a blessing, and the way to be a blessing is put your hand to the plow. If all you've got time to do is kick, it's a sign you ain't doing nothing. Amen. And God's going to call you to come. I ain't your boss, the elders ain't your boss, but God is. Mm -hmm. And he's evaluating your level of commitment and love for him. Amen? Amen. Next, tell somebody, ask somebody, can you be trusted? Can you be trusted? Matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 6, Paul said, that we're gonna, the money that we said we're going to send, Titus is going to carry the money. And then he says, in verse number 17 to verse 20, Paul says, and, and make sure that nobody got an issue with the money, I ain't messing with it. Get this, they trusted Titus more than they trusted Paul. He was trustworthy. Not that Paul was not. But the point is the idea, he was the kind of man who could be trusted. Amen. Paul said, you know Titus' character, you know the kind of heart he has. Titus will take care of the funds that we're bringing. He'll bring the money with him. Amen. I want you to begin to see the significance that if you can be trusted by God, he can use it for great things. Trust, he was trusted with souls and trusted with folks' growth. Right now, you are being trusted with the souls of other people, whether you want to be or not. Because legitimately understand this fact, that to develop the people of God, like it or not, you are a leader. I don't want to be no leader. It don't matter. There are children looking at you as an example of what to be or what not to be. There are people who watch your life. And they watch you. So you, you call yourself a Christian, but you ain't no real Christian. Not real Christian, don't act like that. Right now, for some of us, you are the exact example that will make somebody decide to reject God. Amen. But you ain't got to like it. You are a leader in every capacity. Whether man, woman, boy, or girl, I had older sisters. And my older sister, all of them were sisters, they still led me. Not happily all the time, but they let me. Because they were older than I was. And I want you to realize that you are a leader right now. Where are you leading the people that's following you? Where are they going? Understand the fact that where are you leading? You're a leader. They're watching your step. They're watching your words. They're watching your actions. Some of us have family that will never come to the Lord. Why? Because they are watching you. Whether you can be trusted with souls or not is happening. You're being looked at. You're being evaluated. And you're being assessed. <clears throat> and folks are concluding whether or not you are worth following. If you're not, you put yourself and them in danger. So what's your legacy? What's your legacy? Well, first of all, ask somebody, are you sendable? Are you sendable? And then I said, do you function like a partner? Do you function like a partner? As, are you a blessing? Are you a blessing? And can you be trusted? And can you be trusted? You are leaving a spiritual legacy right now. Be a Titus. It means dying to yourself. It means realizing that there is an expectation that our Father has of you. He's our Father. And as our Father, he has expectations out of all of his children. Put your hands on the plow. Get involved with the work. Find out what it really means to be a Christian. It's a disciple. It's a learner of Jesus. It's somebody that says, I want to be what God wants me to be. As I close out together, I was um, got out of a job call for a year, got out, and I was given the job as a, I was allowed to work at a plant, we were building a plant, a mobile plant in um, southeast Texas. And I was there as a carpenter apprentice. And to be a carpenter apprentice meant I had to go to class and learn how to become a carpenter. Because you can't become a journeyman or a carpenter unless, first of all, you become 
an apprentice. Somebody got to teach you stuff so you can become what you claim to be. Do you not know when you said, I want to be a Christian, it meant I want to learn yeah. more about yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Some of us know more about the shows coming on TV this week than you know about the Lord. Some of us know more about the, the wives of Atlanta, if it's still on the wives, housewives of Atlanta, or New York, or whoever's on TV nowadays, or, or, or hip hop, hip hop, whatever. Love, whatever it is. Some of us know all the latest songs. Some of us know more about everything in the world than you have the foggiest idea about Jesus. Yep. If you're a learner, you gotta come to a class and guess what? Learn. Learn. Amen. What a monumental idea. <laughs> you don't sign up for a college class right. and stay home. <laughs> I don't know why they failed me. You got kids, some of y'all got kids went to school and, and came back with failing grades and said, I don't know why I failed. And and they left you with a bill. <laughs> and you said, go back to class again. Come back not knowing nothing. And see what happened to you. I brought you in. Well, how can you have that attitude about their education? And you don't have that attitude about your own spiritual growth. You can't leave a spiritual legacy if you don't know more than you know right now. And don't assume watching religious programs and periodically listening to something on the radio is a class. Try to get a degree in radiology. <laughs> but I listen to radio every day. You want to know about the Word of God, come and sit in a class and learn and get actively involved so God can bless you and make you better and stronger. You cannot leave a spiritual legacy if it's not already living inside of you. Has God been good to you? Yes. He has blessed you. He has brought you this far. You're here on this morning. If you're not a part of the family of God, if you're not a Christian, I will call to you is not to come and get baptized and go back home. I will call to you as to decide to become a disciple of Jesus. To say, I want him to mold me and remake me. I want to become the kind of person who God can send on a mission. Because once I'm added to the family of God, he does have expectations of you. And if you are not a Christian, I want you to realize our call to you is not to get baptized and go back home. We're not baptisms are us. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> we are calling you for a relationship and a connection with God that will transform your life and remake you over again. And so the steps for becoming a Christian is so simple, you have to have help to misread it. If you believe that Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, if you're willing to have a change of mind, we call that repentance to say no to sin, yes to God, no to my way, and yes to God's way. You get out of your seat and stand before this audience and declare the great, the great confession that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, is the Son of the living God. And upon that confession, Give God your life and give, give God your life and your heart and come and be baptized in Christ because the Bible says he that believes and is baptized shall be saved will assist you in being baptized. But that only puts you in the family that we're called to make disciples and to teach you beyond that. Amen. And the reason you're not strong and you're not vibrant is because you never got your teaching. There are folk not members of the church know more about the church than you do. That don't make crazy sense. Because you've not come to get the second teaching God's supposed to give you. If you're not a Christian, I challenge you and I invite you to come. If you're part of the family of God, what you waiting for? Come and to the vineyard to work. You'd be surprised. As I said before, as I began... As I get older, I become more aware of the importance of leaving something behind me. Amen. 
and I was an advocate of the close out. My, one of the last my, my dad was dying and sat down and did a video recording with him and I together. I went to interview him and talk to him because I wanted, I told him, I said, Dad, I want to make sure I can leave with our with, with kids I won't even meet. A video of you and I together having a conversation where they can understand what made you the man that you are and what man am I trying to be so that in the future when they look at this, they can be aware of the legacy that we try to plant. What do I want the children I never meet to be like? I want them to know he was somebody. I tried to be somebody. And I want them to carry on something that says you belong to us. Yes. Jesus yes. says the same thing. Amen. You hear? Yes. If you're not a part of the family of God, you need to come. If you're a Christian, already in the family, and know that you've not gotten engaged like God wants you to be, you can't leave a spiritual legacy that's not changing your life. Yes. Begin right now. Make that review commitment and having the strength to be a blessing, and I invite you to come right now as we stand and as we sing. Holy Spirit, dwell in me, just touch my eyes that I might see, and all your goodness, grace, and power to stay beside me every hour, be my dream, be my living. I'm requesting prayer. We'll pray for you. The Bible says the fervent, effectual prayers of the righteous will accomplish much. But you can come right now with the assurance and confidence that God loves you and he knows you and he's trying to mold you right now, remake you and strengthen you. You cannot become what he's called you to be until you decide simply to surrender. That doesn't mean you become perfect all of a sudden and got everything together. It means that you begin a process of steps and say, Lord, just help me be better today. 
Let me be a blessing today. Let me trust you more today. Send me today. If you do that, he'll do what he does best. He'll take you, he'll remold you, remold you, remake you, and send you on a path. And right now, what you might just need is prayer. That you can begin the process of change inside your life. Again, if you need prayer, you can raise your hand, I'll walk with you. Someone next to you can walk with you. If you know that you need to make a change, I challenge you to come. Let God remake you and make you over, make you better. Right now, again, as we sing, I invite you to come. Why don't you come as we sing? Restore my spirit, Lord, I need. Restore my heart is weary. Please help me. Thank Brother Humble for that insightful message. Oh, yeah. 